At 183 miles off the coast of Oregon, the seafloor moved. Magnitude 6.0. Shallow, just four miles beneath the Pacific Ocean. The kind of rupture that sends a jolt through seismograph networks from California to British Columbia. The kind that makes emergency managers reach for their phones before the shaking even stops. Within minutes, the questions spread across forums, news comments, and emergency preparedness groups. Is this it? Is Cascadia finally starting? The nightmare scenario that disaster planners have modeled for decades suddenly felt less like an abstract threat and more like a countdown reaching zero. But buried in the technical data streaming through USGS systems, in the strike slip focal mechanism and the precise latitude longitude coordinates, was a detail almost everyone missed in those first frantic hours. This earthquake didn't happen where people thought it did. And that distinction, invisible to most and fundamental to everything, reveals not just a misunderstanding about a single seismic event, but a deeper confusion about what we are actually monitoring when we watch the Pacific Northwest's restless geology. The earthquake occurred approximately 183 miles west of Bandon, Oregon. Far enough offshore that felt reports on land were limited, scattered accounts came from coastal communities, and nothing was reported inland. The kind of muted response you would expect when a significant release of energy happens beneath a hundred miles of ocean water. No tsunami warning materialized. No emergency evacuations. Seismographs recorded a moment magnitude 6.0 at a hypocentral depth of roughly four miles. The USGS confirmed the basics, a shallow focus earthquake, an offshore location placing it well beyond the continental shelf, and a strike-slip focal mechanism indicating horizontal motion rather than the vertical displacement that generates tsunamis. But here's what almost no one noticed in the initial reports. The earthquake did not occur on the Cascadia subduction zone. That is the megathrust fault system that emergency planners lose sleep over, the boundary capable of generating magnitude 9 earthquakes and basin-wide tsunamis. It occurred on the Blanco fracture zone, a transform fault boundary that most people have never heard of, even though it produces earthquakes several times per year. The Blanco fracture zone is where the Pacific Plate and the Juan de Fuca Plate slide horizontally past each other, a strike-slip boundary similar in mechanism to California's San Andreas Fault, but underwater and largely unknown outside seismological circles. The plates are not colliding or separating. They grind laterally, accumulating and releasing stress in a fundamentally different way than a subduction zone. Earthquakes on the Blanco are common. Magnitude 5 earthquakes, magnitude 6 earthquakes, and occasionally larger events occur. The Pacific Seafloor Seismic Network, operated by the University of Washington and funded by the National Science Foundation, records this activity continuously. There are thousands of smaller events per year, dozens of magnitude 4 plus events, and several that break into the magnitude 5 to 6 range. It is normal geology doing normal things, a transform boundary behaving exactly as plate tectonic theory predicts. The focal mechanism, the mathematical description of how the fault moved, showed pure strike-slip motion. No vertical component, no tsunami generation potential. It is the kind of earthquake that releases stress without creating the uplift or subsidence that displaces massive volumes of water. This is not Cascadia, it never was. Understanding why this matters requires understanding what Cascadia actually is, and more importantly, what it is not. The Cascadia subduction zone is a mega thrust fault where the Juan de Fuca plate dives beneath the North American plate at a rate of roughly 40 millimeters per year. It is a convergent boundary extending about 700 miles from Northern California to Vancouver Island, locked at shallow depths where the plates are stuck together, accumulating centuries of strain that will eventually release in a single catastrophic rupture. When a subduction zone fails, the overriding plate, in this case North America, rebounds upward. The seafloor can rise several meters in seconds. That vertical motion displaces the entire water column above it, 
generating tsunami waves that radiate outward at the speed of a commercial jet. It is a fundamentally different mechanism than the horizontal grinding of the Blanco fracture zone. In those first hours, people asked whether a Blanco earthquake could trigger Cascadia, and that question reveals a fundamental misunderstanding about how fault systems interact. Seismologists have been clear about this for decades. The Blanco and Cascadia are separate systems. They are different fault types, different stress regimes, different geometries. The Blanco releases stress through frequent moderate earthquakes. Cascadia accumulates stress over centuries and releases it all at once. The stress transfer from a magnitude 6 event on the Blanco does not reach Cascadia in any meaningful way. The Coulomb stress change, the technical term for how one earthquake can load stress onto nearby faults, drops off rapidly with distance. A moderate event 183 miles offshore, on a different fault system with a different orientation, simply does not impart enough stress to trigger a megathrust rupture on Cascadia. The math is unambiguous. The physics is settled. Every time there is a Blanco earthquake, the same cycle repeats. Panic, misidentification, clarification. And beneath all that noise, Cascadia remains exactly as dangerous, or as benign, as it was before the Blanco event occurred. But here's what seismologists are actually monitoring, the signal they're listening for beneath the noise of everyday seismicity. Episodic tremor and slip. These are slow, deep creep events that occur at depths of roughly 30 to 45 kilometers along the Cascadia interface, far below the locked zone where the megathrust earthquake will eventually nucleate. This is a transitional region where the plates are slowly, continuously sliding past each other. Unlike regular earthquakes that release their energy in seconds, episodic tremor and slip events unfold over days or weeks. They are accompanied by harmonic tremor, a continuous seismic signal that looks more like volcanic activity than traditional earthquakes. They also produce measurable surface deformation of a few millimeters, detectable only by GPS networks and borehole strain meters. People do not feel them, buildings do not shake, but the instruments record them with precision, and they repeat on a predictable schedule roughly every 14 to 15 months in most sections of Cascadia, like a geologic metronome ticking away beneath the Pacific Northwest. These events matter because they represent the loading and unloading of stress on the deeper portions of the fault. Some researchers have proposed that episodic tremor and slip events could potentially influence the timing of great earthquakes, though the evidence remains ambiguous. Others argue they are simply a stress relief mechanism that has no bearing on when the locked zone will fail. What is certain is that monitoring episodic tremor and slip gives seismologists insight into the behavior of the deeper fault, into how stress is distributed along the interface, and into the mechanical properties of the subduction zone that will ultimately control how a great earthquake ruptures when it finally occurs. The Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, in collaboration with the Geological Survey of Canada, tracks these events continuously. When an episodic tremor and slip sequence begins, the data goes public. Researchers publish updates. The information is freely available to anyone interested in actually understanding what Cascadia is doing right now beneath the surface, invisible to everyone except the instruments specifically designed to detect it. This is the signal worth watching. Not offshore earthquakes on the Blanco. Not every magnitude 5 or 6 that occurs hundreds of miles from the coast. The evidence that Cascadia can produce magnitude 9.0 earthquakes is not theoretical. It is historical, written in the geologic record, and confirmed by documents from across the Pacific. January 26, 1700. The entire length of the Cascadia subduction zone failed in a single rupture, roughly 700 miles from Northern California to Vancouver Island. The magnitude is estimated at 9.0 or larger. The rupture lasted several minutes. Coastal regions subsided from 1 to 2 meters instantaneously as the locked portion of the fault released centuries of accumulated strain. The tsunami generated by this event 
crossed the Pacific Ocean and struck the coast of Japan roughly nine hours later, where it was recorded in historical documents, including damage reports, flooding accounts, and even insurance claims. Japanese researchers in the 1990s analyzed these records and determined that a tsunami had arrived with no corresponding Japanese earthquake, an orphan tsunami that could only have been generated by a distant source. When they worked backward from the Japanese records, timing the wave propagation and modeling the source location, the evidence pointed unambiguously to Cascadia. The timing matched, the wave heights matched, and when geologists examined the Pacific Northwest coast, they found the physical evidence, buried marshes, drowned forests, and sand layers deposited by tsunami inundation, all dating to the same time period. This is not speculative. This is not a worst-case scenario invented by emergency managers. This happened, and the evidence is irrefutable. The question is not whether Cascadia can produce a magnitude 9 earthquake, it is when the next one will occur, and whether the Pacific Northwest is prepared for what that will mean. Oregon Emergency Management cites a roughly 37% probability of a magnitude 7.1 or larger Cascadia earthquake in the next 50 years. That is not a fringe estimate from alarmist researchers. It is the official risk assessment used for planning purposes, derived from paleoseismic data, slip rate measurements, and historical recurrence intervals. 37%, roughly one in three, the same odds you would get from rolling a die and betting on one or two. But the conversation about Cascadia focuses almost entirely on the shaking and the tsunami, the immediate, obvious catastrophic impacts. What gets mentioned far less often, what most people have never considered, is the permanent change to the coastline that will occur the moment the fault ruptures. Sudden coastal subsidence. When the locked portion of Cascadia fails and the North American plate rebounds, coastal regions will drop, not gradually over decades, but in seconds. Estimates range from half a meter to two meters, depending on location, with the highest subsidence expected along the central Oregon and Washington coast. One detailed analysis examined what this means for flood exposure. The numbers are stark. It estimated 14,350 additional residents suddenly living in expanded floodplains, 22,500 additional structures at risk, and 777 additional miles of roads within the post-subsidence flood zone. These are not temporary impacts. The coastline does not bounce back. After 1,700, coastal forests that had stood for centuries were suddenly below high tide. They drowned in place, and their stumps are still visible today at low tide. Ghost forests mark the new elevation, a permanent record of what happens when the fault releases. Engineering implications are profound. Storm surge that currently stops at designed elevations will reach higher. King tides will flood areas that were previously safe. Infrastructure built to withstand a 100-year flood will face those conditions annually or more frequently. And this happens before any tsunami arrives, before any buildings collapse from shaking, before the emergency response even begins. The moment the fault ruptures, the geography changes, and every assumption about flood risk becomes obsolete. So where does this leave us? Standing on the edge of the Pacific, watching the seismographs record another offshore earthquake that was not Cascadia, but reminded everyone that Cascadia exists, the answer is neither panic nor complacency. Not every offshore earthquake signals the beginning of a megathrust rupture. The Blanco fracture zone will continue producing magnitude six events. It is what transform boundaries do. It is normal, and it is not a countdown to catastrophe. Panicking over routine seismicity serves no purpose except to exhaust the capacity for appropriate concern when something genuinely anomalous occurs. But dismissing Cascadia because this particular earthquake was not related to it is the opposite error, equally dangerous and equally divorced from what the science actually tells us. The 37% probability over 50 years is real. The historical precedent is real. The subsidence risk is real. 
the fact that we cannot predict when the next great earthquake will occur does not make it less certain that it will occur. It only makes it more important that preparation happens before urgency makes preparation impossible. The question is no longer whether we believe Cascadia is a threat, but whether we are willing to act on that belief before the belief becomes irrelevant. Practical preparation defeats abstract fear. The actions that matter are not complicated, but they require intention and follow through before the crisis makes them impossible to implement. Emergency supplies. Not three days, but two weeks. Water, food, medical supplies, battery-powered radio, flashlights, and cash. Enough to sustain your household through the immediate aftermath when infrastructure has failed and external help has not arrived yet. Evacuation planning. Know the tsunami inundation zones if you live on the coast. Know the routes to high ground. Practice them. Make sure every member of your household knows what to do if shaking lasts longer than 20 seconds, because that duration means Cascadia, and Cascadia means tsunami, and there will not be time for discussion or debate. Structural retrofitting for homes built before modern seismic codes. Foundation bolting, cripple wall bracing, water heater strapping. The upgrades that prevent collapse, that create survivable spaces, that make the difference between losing a house and losing a life. Official alert systems. Register for emergency notifications. Follow USGS earthquake alerts. Trust the tsunami warning system. When the National Tsunami Warning Center issues an alert, the time for skepticism has passed. The reality is this. Preparation is not about eliminating risk. It is about surviving what cannot be prevented. Cascadia will rupture again. The only variable is whether we will be ready when it does, or whether we will spend the years between now and then convincing ourselves that routine offshore earthquakes are the signal we should be worried about while ignoring the genuine, well-documented, historically proven threat that requires nothing more than acknowledgement and action. The fault is loading. The instruments are recording. The choice about what to do with that information belongs to each of us, individually and collectively, in the time we have left before abstraction becomes experience.